Welcome to today's KM World webinar, brought to you by Verant, LucidWorks, and Pivotry. I'm Mary D. Ojala, Editor-in-Chief at KM World Magazine. I will be the moderator for today's broadcast. <clears throat> Our presentation today is titled, Top KM Practices for Optimizing Customer Experience. But before we get started, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. So if you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. But if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response to it within a few days. Plus, all viewers will be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for viewing today's webinar. And now to introduce our speakers for today, John Schmay, Senior Director, KM Strategy, Verant, Pat Heffel, Head of Partner Success, LucidWorks, Chantal Schweitzer, Practice Director, Strategic Data Services, Pivotry. And now let me pass the event to John Schmay, Senior Director, KM Strategy, Verant. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Mary D. and hi, everybody. Uh, as Mary D. mentioned, I'm a KM strategy person. I'm a longtime KM practitioner uh, since I, before there was an internet, I like to say. And I want to talk a little bit about techniques for uh, automating customer experience and making it more seamless. Um, as a way of doing so, I'm going to do something I don't do as much on other webinars I've done before here, which is I'm going to show you more product because I think th the way to best visualize a good CX experience is to see it rather than give you a bunch of bulleted slides. So let's let's go ahead and get going here. Just setting the context for what Verant does, uh, we're, uh, we make about 40 uh, products having to do with contact center optimization, workforce management, speech analytics, quality management, Asia desktops, a whole bunch of stuff. And knowledge management is one of our uh, main products. Uh, the thing we're trying to solve with this is what we call the CX, the uh, customer engagement gap, where there's more and more expectations for how well support should be done, how automated it should be, how it should be seamless across channels. And people do not have the budget to just keep throwing bodies at it. So we've got to find ways to automate the customer experience and make it uh, personalized and excellent while still uh, minimizing the amount of people that have to talk to people to get that done. So one of the things that, that I like to express, which might be of interest to this audience, you may have different opinions about this, but try and point out to people that we've come a long way since the search box and the results list of the 90s where that was kind of your knowledge management experience. Uh, we've evolved into self-service uh, 20 years ago. It's become more and more sophisticated. And then in the last, I'd say, five to 10 years, contextual knowledge has been a big deal where I try to gather information about my user and the products and services, maybe some of their history, what they're asking about, and use that to drive knowledge forward and make it automated right to the user when possible. And I would say we're in the era now especially with AI and a lot of the automation tools of what we would call CX automation, where knowledge is embedded on platforms, embedded in different tools, lots of different applications now to get at information. And so that's what I'm gonna show you now are some of our CX automation capabilities to optimize the customer experience. Our knowledge management tool set employs a lot of this automation, whether it's search, whether it's what you get to see, depending on who you are, ways to link products through APIs in seamless ways, automating the delivery of knowledge on certain channels, making it easier to manage also through parts of automation, and then also making it easy to continuously improve. Any of us who have done knowledge management understand that the continuous improvement is a key aspect of keeping knowledge up to date and keeping it relevant for your audience. So let's talk about these in a little more detail and show some examples. So search automation in our view has to do with a couple of things that one of the first ones is cognitive search where the index is smart it understands concepts from the user's query can actually understand other words that might be relevant that weren't in the query that are not just synonyms and actually provides that information in real time so that when the user asks a question or types a query they get what they mean not what they type and because it's in the index you don't have to do a lot of uh, training sets or things like that the minute you start putting knowledge in the knowledge base, you can generate relevant results. So that's a form of AI in the cognitive search model that allows for search automation to some degree and also um, makes it more scalable and less maintenance required. 
Now, self-service can apply some of these same principles. As people are filling out forms or asking questions or doing interactions on your website, you can actually bring back answers while they're working to mitigate their uh, need to actually, uh, you know, ask any uh, ask the call center to get them through the process they're doing and make sure they have a good self-service experience so they have the feeling that the organization is supporting them right alongside the process they're trying to do and helping them make sure they're successful and that they understand what they've done. So that's automated answers for self-service. And self-service in, in you know, contact center support world is often, usually, the preponderance of interactions. Uh, nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to call support, right? So the more you can get the answers for yourself and the more that knowledge can come through to you automatically as you work, the better your experience will be. This is an example of an agent desktop. This is not Varen, it's Avaya. Uh, most desktops for support have a similar configuration where on the left is something happening with the customer on the right. In this example, there's a chat coming in on a widget on the left with questions and interactions. On the right, the knowledge base has been integrated into this uh, knowledge desktop. So as the agent's working on helping resolve the chat, the chat text is actually pumping into the knowledge base automatically, and they're getting answers that they can provide directly to the chat uh, participant in real time. So this makes it easier for the agent to find the right answers. It makes sure the right content formatted the right way shows up on the chat channel and also speeds this whole activity along so that uh, these types of uh, support agents can answer, answer many, many more chats during the day and keep that channel really lively and meaningful for customers. So that's another CX improvement for the chat experience through assisted support automated on the back end with knowledge. Here's another interesting one for the support desktop itself. So for those of you that maybe have never seen a CRM system or an agent desktop, basically it's where support agents do their work, right? Work comes in, uh, questions are posed. Uh, it's either from a call or some other channel, social media, chat, uh, web, and their job is to figure out the answer to that question. Now, the way you can integrate this in an automated fashion has to do with how you can trigger knowledge based on what you're seeing in the case interaction, whether they're asking a question, whether they've done some interactions, more about the context of the question or the call that you can pump in. And so as the agent works, the knowledge panel begins to display information. And as the call evolves into whatever topic it needs to, the knowledge changes because the information passed to the knowledge base changes. So this information is coming from a live knowledge base curated by experts, kept up to date, and automatically triggered. And because it's coming from the knowledge base directly, if there are changes or updates to the content, they automatically change the results so that users see only the latest, greatest information. It's what we call a suggestion bot. It's the real-time desktop integration. You can apply this to speech analytics. We have a high-end AI-driven speech analytics product. So it monitors the customer conversation and you build these triggers into the conversation based on common topics so that the same thing happens that I was describing earlier, except it's dynamic to the call. So now I'm talking to a customer and the information is coming to me if anything really you know, important and sort of you know, well known as a trigger shows up. In this example, how come my bill is so high? Common question for utilities or any of these organizations that you know, have consumer interactions. Well, right here, the knowledge comes from the conversation and it triggers information that's useful. So now it's what we call zero click knowledge. The agent can focus on their work, on focusing on the customer interaction, and troubleshooting for them, and the knowledge, again, as a companion working with them to optimize their interactions and make sure they're providing the very best customer service. Makes it easier, makes it faster. Everybody wins. The customer gets better information. The agent is more productive, and the organization sees, sees value through the efficiency of that interaction. Another way to optimize the customer experience is by integrating knowledge directly into what we call interactive voice assistants or bots. And those things are driven by AI themselves. They're pretty intelligent. And so they can actually be configured to bring knowledge back either way. So you can bring back an IVA uh, chat. And we've all seen this. Uh, the chat is offered to you on many, many websites. But there's also the other aspect where while I'm working something, that you're, I've got the chat channel open, it can actually start to recommend knowledge because the chat is sort of an, an active and uh, listening entity but through the integration so that as I'm working, it's like, I, again, I have an assistant by my side helping me figure out what it is I need when I need it just in time. Better customer experience, information as I need it. And the more you can 
uh, help customers self-serve on their channel of choice, the less time that you have to spend in the call center having individuals talk to them. Uh, self-service interactions, as we know, are pennies on the dollar for every type of interaction. And so here's where we have another one where we uh, optimize the chat interface. And as I showed earlier, you may, may have noticed in the uh, Avaya situation, we have the capacity to bring in chats into the agent desktop for assisted support on the chat channel. So there's a lot of ways you can make chat intelligent and extend the functionality beyond simple scripts and use either uh, powerful AI chat tools and or assisted support that's automated to make it faster and more efficient. Here's another one uh, that's been around for a, a fairly long time, but it's, it's sort of getting a renaissance in, again, the proliferation of online tools and uh, the interest in community for support. The idea that I have a, a community of people that want to use my product, they're you know, passionate and enthusiastic about it, they can maybe answer each other's questions on community. But in cases where the organization wants to provide organizationally valid answers, you know, well curated, and can listen to the community conversations, the knowledge base can provide information uh, in the community thread. Uh, knowledge, in, in our example here, can be folded into the community experience so that you can get information from other users, or if you want to look at the latest information on it, all that can be integrated so that whatever topic or thing you're researching can uh, provide answers from both if you want to see them at the same time. So a lot of different use cases and scenarios where the community knowledge and the self-service knowledge get merged together and you create a nice seamless experience that sort of gives you the best of both possible worlds. You can see what other users know and you can see what the organization knows. Again, superior customer experience because now I'm not worrying about where the information comes from. I have access to all the places I might want to find it in one view. So the notion at the end of the day is this concept of knowledge as a service so that knowledge can be driven to any interface, any touch point where people need it. it, can be done automatically, can be embedded in other functions, is context sensitive, so it can listen to what you're talking about, what, who you are, what you've done before, and then on the back end with knowledge management, we apply the classic techniques of entitling information, sectioning it for different uh, audiences, uh, maybe providing segments or predefined sections to make it easier to manage and show for different audiences and there's authoring tools to let you push it in depending on the channel so that it's formatted right for the right channel so there's a whole bunch of complementary features in the knowledge base and all this exposure to these different channel to these different channels means that knowledge now has more value as an asset across more channels and more interactions in the customer support and service organization so knowledge as a service is a powerful concept when you can back it with all of these connections and all this intelligent automation the last thing I want to touch on really briefly is this notion of continuous improvement. For this audience, we all know that continuous improvement is critical. Uh, knowledge is not complete and it's never obsolete. So you're, you're always changing it, you're always improving it, and you're only as good as the stuff you vend forward. And nobody has the time to look at all the information that evolves in their organization. They have to prioritize what's important and they can start to measure the customer experience itself with the proper feedback. So we've developed these dashboarding capabilities that, that are a step ahead of just a, a separate BI tool. This is an enterprise data hub that pulls information from multiple channels, ingests it into one common set of uh, parameters and data points, uses AI to organize it and, and vet it out in meaningful ways, and then creates a, a, this analytics dashboard we call the uh, engagement data, you know, uh, aptip, you know it's EDI, it's basically the engagement data insights, right? And this dashboard, you know, dashboards always have uh, a lot of different things on them. But the thing that's neat about this is you can use natural language to query this. Show me the number of calls on this topic that had high talk time. You can do that kind of a search here. And as a result, because the data is already pre-ingested, the reports are already available to you. You as a business manager just do not have to worry about running reports, what's in the report, figuring out the data points you need, you can craft that experience for yourself and for multiple business units across the organization. So you don't need to have some data expert that you supplicate to to find the right data you need. You can go ahead and start integrating this. And the more channels you can ingest from your organization, maybe your, your call channels, your self-service channels, your knowledge channels, the more powerfully correlated reports you can, you can generate, right? So there's a whole lot of interesting power and possibility in pulling this together. At the end of the day, 
knowledge is the oil that runs the engine through all these things. And so knowledge management, in our view, has become more important than ever because it's a key part of the interactions that we can bend out to these platforms and multi-channel capabilities. So we're really excited about the future for all knowledge automation and the power of knowledge management. With that, I will hand it over. Great, thank you, John. And now let me pass the event over to Pat Heffel, Head of Partner Success, LucidWorks. Go ahead, Pat. Thanks, Mary D. And thank you, John. Great presentation. That was really great stuff. Knowledge is the oil that runs the engine of uh, the business world, certainly, and most of our personal lives as well. So uh, thank you for that. And I want to, I'll just jump in so that we maximize our time here. Uh, I want to talk about some top KM practices for optimizing customer experience. And, and I'll just uh, piggyback on what John said that uh, I've been in the knowledge management world for quite a long time. Uh, I am in the search space now working for LucidWorks. We bring uh, optimal search experiences to the largest and most complex customers in the world. And uh, that is uh, where we where we really see the the best opportunity and and the most need so we love being able to do that uh in terms of i have five suggestions for you that's that's what i came to share that when uh when you're optimizing customer experience uh there are there's a lot of tips tricks whatever but uh what i want to offer today number one and and john touched on this too relevant results is the number one requirement what we find in our business is that um, technology is whatever, but what our users are really looking for, our clients are really trying to get to is uh, relevant results. They, uh, they need to see the most relevant solution in front of them in the shortest amount of time. Uh, another suggestion is put the user in control of their experience reduce cognitive load and that's hard to do in the age of exploding information uh, so from an experience standpoint that's uh, that's a critical thing to consider make a human connection we don't talk about that enough um, but i will and provide a unique and immersive experience so uh, let me jump right in here relevant results this is what lucidworks is all about this is what lucidworks does this is our bread and butter. So, um, and it is, as I said in the intro, exactly the thing that users buy. They don't buy technology, they buy relevant results. And when you're a, uh, a customer service agent uh, in the, just like the screenshots that John showed and you have a, you're live in a call and you need an answer right now, you need the right answer at the right time. Uh, coming uh, for the last 20 years, keyword search uh, has been the, the mainstay and I'm gonna go bottom to top instead of top to bottom. So just so you can track the foundation of providing these capabilities uh, is in two stacks. There's the keyword search engine, that's the elastic search, the solar, and some of the uh, maybe older search technologies that uh, are still out there. Um, and then, uh, Paired with that in today's world is large language models. There's no escaping it. You can't have a conversation in a business setting today without someone mentioning AI. So um, I'm going to rip off that Band-Aid and, um, and talk about it. So on top of this keyword search engine, and Lucidworks uses Solar internally as, as the search engine that we wrap and, and take extreme advantage of the keyword search uh, capability that we build on top of that engine um, serves an important purpose especially when you're looking for very specific results that you you need uh, where you need exactness on the other side uh, large language models provide the ability to do a semantic vector search and vector search is uh, an important part of the conversation these days but uh, 
it's inexact. It's it, it's beautiful in its generality. It gives you the ability to be close. And when the user asks for not exactly the right thing, which is super common, then um, having that um, uh, that ability to be uh, a little bit loose with exactness is incredibly valuable because those rules that had to be built in the keyword search engines of the last 20 years are impossible to keep up with. And uh, it's constant tinkering and you're always tuning the rules and you're giving up this for that. And um, the, the large language models at vector search give us an answer to that problem. But we find that um, we need to marry semantic vector search with keyword search um, to get the best of both worlds. Because if you need a part number, for example, keyword search is going to give it to you when vector search rarely or not very often will. So, um, so let's call it romantic vector search. I'm going to turn coin a phrase here. Surprise! Uh, romantic vector search married to keyword search gives you the orange box neural hybrid search, and that's a term that Lucid Works has uh, has coined as the the intersection of these two uh, critical capabilities coming together to provide a single solution for both keyword search and vector search in uh, in one query. And then on top of that, retrieval augmented generation, that's the pink box that uh, is the most common implementation of an AI generated response. Uh, and um, that's uh, so many, so many companies are, are moving in that direction to overcome the the hallucination problem where uh where the an llm might make stuff up that's not really true and it gets that's because it gets its rag works because it gets its data from the hybrid search underneath and then uh, the chat gpt style uh chat bots um, built on large language models exclusively they don't uh they don't operate on this on the keyword search engines this is the progression from bottom to top, from foundation to uh, summit that um, represents the progression of uh, maturity in the solutions that that we're that cl clients are asking us for, and that we're um, uh, increasingly offering to our clients. So, to give you another look at how this, uh, another picture of how this works. Um, this progression from left to right in lower maturity, and this actually aligns nicely to, to a slide that John had as well, where uh, a single source keyword-based site search is your least mature, and we migrate through multiple uh, sources, multiple data sources into semantic vector search, into neural hybrid search, and then into generative AI uh and generated chat like responses this is um this is the migration that that search is taking in the industry today providing a solid experience for your clients means giving them the right amount of control if uh if the user has to make every decision, and it's easy to build those UIs where the user has to make every decision is very expensive and heavy, it takes too much effort and they tune out. When, uh, when you build an automated system that makes all the decisions, then you take the control away from the user and they don't, they don't really love that either. They're like, hey, I, I want to have some, some uh, agency here. So it's possible to go too far in the automation space. What we want to do is find that Goldilocks place in the middle where there's shared decision making. The user has control over what feel like the important decisions, but the automation handles a lot of the, the uh, painful repetitive work that they don't like to do. And so uh, you find this just right equilibrium and by providing that just right 
middle ground. It gives the user a sense of control without taking away their ability to do what humans do so well. So um, we find that's a that's a, a great way to strike that balance. Lowering cognitive load. Who doesn't who doesn't resonate with this picture, right? I that's where I want to be. This is no stress, no decisions to make, just right. However, this Amazon account, if you were to count across the number of pieces of information on this screen, I love Amazon, I use Amazon, so many people do, but there's a lot of decisions that they're asking you to make here. And this is, uh, this is the other side, this is heavy cognitive load. And in terms of creating a great experience, um, something that's closer to, again, that middle ground, not this super heavy, um, load that you're you're putting on your client or your service rep, um, but not necessarily um, taking everything away from them. Uh, Google seems to be have mastered this because they found this middle ground uh, that's very light but highly uh, highly functional. And I, I just love the example of a simple UI that does a lot, but also offers control. So I wanna to touch just for a minute on human connection. Tech is cool, but we're still people and we don't wanna lose in, in all of the automation and all of the um, intelligence and machine everything that we're still people. And to the extent that we can still connect with people, um, the, the things that help do that are personalization, um, auto-suggesting from others' searches. It helps me know, hey, uh, the thing that I typed in that search bar, other people are searching for that too. Oh, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not out in left field. I'm part of a group of other people who care about the same thing. And whether it's your favorite sports team or whether it's the lunch menu or whether it's the, uh, you know, the sales report, Knowing that you're not alone, there's a there's a real connecting value there um, in your experience. Build an experience that uses their name. It's a connecting human uh, identifying experience that that allows you to feel seen. And that's really helpful. Um, use emotional language like thank you. Good to see you. Hi. Some form of um, your problem that you came to me with matters to me. It's, uh, it seems silly in some ways, but it's really not because it creates this connection that creates a sense of safety and a sense of relatedness that keeps your customers coming back. Uh, and if you can sprinkle in some humor, brain science actually shows that there's a huge value in um, being able to um, reduce the stress by adding humor. It's, a, it's fascinating research. Finally, uh, this guy on the right is having an immersive experience. I'm not sure that's the kind of immersion that we're talking about, uh, but unique, memorable, and surprising experiences are what stick in people's minds and make them go, uh, well, I re at least I remember it. Like this guy is gonna remember uh, his experience getting pushed into a pool. If you want to immerse and engage your users, research clearly shows that their experience with your environment needs to be unique, something not just um, vanilla. It needs to be surprising in a good way. Ideally, wow, that was an awesomely relevant search result I just got. Um, uh, and dramatize just a little bit with a story, which means uh, providing and then solving a problem and, and wrapping it up in a way that, uh, that resonates with the user. So in summary, um, there are a lot of ways to optimize the customer experience. These suggestions about providing relevant results, first and foremost, always, give the users some control of their experience, reduce the cognitive load as much as you can, 
make a human connection and provide a unique and immersive experience. Thanks so much for your time. I'm grateful for the opportunity. If you need to reach out to me, there's my, there's my contact information. Thanks. Tim. Thank you, Pat. That's great. Thanks so much. Now let's pass the event to Chantal Schweitzer, practice director, strategic data services, Pivotry. Go ahead, Chantal. All right. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on the product data aspect of KM and how importantly that affects your customer experience. We really want to make sure we're thinking about this from a frictionless commerce perspective. We want our customers to be able to find, buy, trust, get to their product as quickly as possible. So when we're thinking about this, there's a whole ecosystem that is that really helps run your product data efficiently. And pieces of this include what is your data strategy? What is your current state of your data? And where do you want to get to? And how do you get there? How do you plan out that program? Another key aspect, and for me as a taxonomist, the most important piece is taxonomy design. There are many different taxonomies that are used to describe your products and help organize your products for different purposes. The most commonly well-known one being the ones on your e-commerce sites. When you're shopping for a product on a specific site, uh, you have a taxonomy that helps you navigate down to a specific set of products and then filters to even narrow that down further. That is our e-commerce taxonomy. That can't exist efficiently without your back-end attribution taxonomy, which helps you organize your category-specific attributes, which are designed as sets of schema within your taxonomy. A light bulb may have attributes to describe it, like lumens, voltage, color temperature, where a ladder may have different attributes to describe it, like weight capacity and maximum expandable height and material. So all this needs to be organized in the back end efficiently to ensure that you have that clean product data. You then have classification. You need to make sure that your products are classified to these taxonomies correctly. And we want to make sure that data is normalized. So as you build out your SKUs, you have some standardization to make sure that pluralization, capitalization, uh, UOMs, uh, special characters are all being formatted consistently so your data is clean and consistent. There's product relationships that can help link products to each other and help build the cart, like required accessories and optional accessories. If you have a cell phone, you have a required accessory of the charging cord because you need it to operate your cell phone. But you may have a, an optional accessory of a case because it helps enhance the use of that cell phone. There's plenty of other ones out there like substitute products. Um, if something is has a long lead time or is out of stock, upsells, cross-sells, there's many different product relationships out there. And none of this can work without product data governance. Governance is a huge pillar of success when it comes to your data ecosystem. You have to have a strong governance uh, with the three pillars of products, or I'm sorry, people, processes, and technology to help stand all of this up. So what does good product data look like? There's really four C's that need to be thought of as you're designing your product data strategy. You want your data to be complete, clean, consistent, and clear. If your data isn't complete and you have a lot of gaps in your data, that's gonna cause a lot of downstream problems to your customer experience. If they are looking through filters for products and perhaps your ladder doesn't have weight capacity filled in, then that particular product is going to be invisible to that filter. And we wanna make sure the customers can see all the products that may suit their particular need. We want to make sure the data is clean. And this is another thing that affects filters as well for that customer experience. When they're shopping for their products, they don't want to see a lot of duplicate values within their filters. And to ensure that doesn't happen, we need that data to be clean. We don't have uh, extra spaces, duplicate values, and uh, possibly different uh, spellings of different terms. We want it to be clean. And that also goes with consistent. We want to make sure that the UOMs are being used efficiently. We don't want to see a 120 V, 120 VAC, 120 volts. We want to see simply one of those things, and we want those UOMs to be consistent across the product data set. And we want it to be clear. As a customer is looking through a list of, uh, of products, we want those product descriptions to be very clear as to what they are, and also in the same consistent format. So people can stroll or scroll through those items very efficiently. And really, these are the best, uh, the best practices are these building blocks. We want to focus our attribution taxonomy on what we call isness. That's literally what the products are, not what they're applied to, not what brand they're associated with, what they are, because that's going to really drive that attribution sharedness across products effectively. 
We wanted to make sure it's mutually exclusive, that there is one logical location for each of your products within that taxonomy. And that's going to really help your internal customer experience as well. If we can streamline that item onboarding process and reduce the frustration for those who are trying to get these products onboarded, understand what data needs to be filled in for each product, and have it easy to classify, even using AI tools to help suggest what classification should be necessary, that can really help out. We want to make sure that we're avoiding ambiguity. This is a big one. We don't want junk for categories like other or miscellaneous within those data sets. And this applies both for that e-commerce taxonomy that a customer is going to be shopping and an attribution taxonomy that your internal customers are going to be classifying to. These often turn into big junk drawers, a big hodgepodge of different kinds of products that might lie within it that really have nothing to do with each other. And it really hurts. Uh, the customer experience is going to be hurt by this because they're not going to want to scroll, uh, scroll through hundreds of items within this junk drawer. Uh, there are several other ones up there, but I'm going to keep on moving. There we go. So having product data, how does this help people out? How does this really create that frictionless customer experience? For our internal customers, for our for uh, the people out there who are driving these sites, there's a lot of things that this is how the clean customer, uh, I'm sorry, clean product data is going to help them out. It's going to increase revenue. If you have clean data, then the customers are going to appreciate that. They're going to have that very seamless experience being able to find the products that they want to buy, the information about those products to give them a confident purchase decision, and after they get the products, if they need information on how to use it, being able to go back and find that data efficiently is going to give them an end-to-end -end really, really great experience. And that's what we want to do. And if they have it, they're going to keep coming back, and that's going to increase your revenue. Great product data is also going to enhance your recall and precision of your search tool. People don't always use the taxonomy. I've even pretty much guessed that they probably use search a little bit more. And having clean taxonomy categories, having clean attributes to describe your products with clean data values, all of that is going to drive better search results. And it's going to get them to their products much faster. For the internal customers, having this clean data setup is going to decrease your time to market. They can get these products uh, onboarded quickly because they know exactly what data points need to be filled in and how to fill those data points in. And if you can get that to the market faster, then you're bringing your customers the products they want faster, and you can get the market share of those particular products. Uh, with that, um, we talked about how that reduces the cost of uh, new um, of product onboarding, but it also helps enable things like cross-sell and upsell with those product relationships. It helps people who, uh, like in the customer service sphere or the sales sphere, if they need specific pieces of information to help a customer out, having this data easily findable helps them do their job and do it much more efficiently, pleasing the customer much further. It's also going to provide a, a, um, an easier line of syndication. If you have multiple suppliers bringing you data, or if you need to send data down to multiple channels like the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Ebays of the world, this will help that happen much more efficiently. There's definitely some numbers we've seen in our experience associated with this. When you have good, strong, clean product data, we see an increase in conversion rates. We see an increase in site traffic from 5 to 15%. We see the average order value increase because of those product relationships. We see on-site search precision uh, become much more precise and help in, uh, and drive those conversion rates once again. And this is a big one. It really helps reduce returns. We've seen this from 10 to 30%. If the product data is there for the customer to make that confident purchasing decision or leaving them with no questions and they get the product that they expect to get and it solves their problem, they're going to be much less likely to return those products, which is a huge um, issue that a lot of companies have to deal with today is how to bring those returns back and do it sustainably. So some of the things I that we would recommend that you think of when you're thinking about your current data maturity and how to get to the next level, you want to assess your current state. Where are you today? Do a competitive assessment. See where your competitors are at today. Look at those data functionalities on websites. See where they're really driving ahead and where you're driving ahead and find a, a roadmap on how to get there. Taxonomy workshops, make sure everybody understands the governance culture of strong product data. Get people onboarded onto the importance of product data through these taxonomy workshops. And then get to the, your final recommendations in your roadmap. What is going to be your full data strategy to get to that next level? There's a lot of great tools out there now that, uh, that can 
helps drive scalability and make these things happen much faster. Patrick talked about AI, and I'm going to bring it up once again. Uh, there's a lot of great things we can use. There's uh, tools out there that help you scrape websites and scrape uh, PDFs to be able to get data if you have a lot of suppliers. There's tools that can help you with classification, making the classification lift happen much faster and with better accuracy. There's normalization automation. If you have specific style guideline rules around pluralization and punctuation, et cetera, you can use some tools to address that. And there's uh, ways that you can augment data using these tools. So AI can do so many things these days to really help drive scalability and drive success. But I do want to say a lot of this does require still a human in the loop. We want to make sure that this is continuously being tweaked and QA'd to make sure that it is going the way that you want it to. So always keep that person in there. We have a customer that we've been with for many years that we're helping to do this with. They're a large scale MRO distributor uh, with 14 billion in sales, and we help them onboard their products uh, every year. We've uh, helped enrich over uh, 400,000 SKUs per year, and we've helped them get that onboarded quickly with high accuracy of data and uh, with a very high level of completeness. And this really helps ensure their success. We can make sure that their customer experience is very strong through their product data. And I couldn't st can't stress enough how important that product data goes to a very strong customer experience. All right, so starting to wrap up here. Um, if you haven't heard of Pivot Tree before, we are a global organization. We have employees all over the globe, and we help people drive these experiences. I particularly drive product data experiences. I'm a big nerd about product data. I am pretty much obsessed with it, and I really like helping people solve these product data problems. And we have a couple of QR codes. If you're interested, you could, uh, we do a free data assessment if you want to see where your product data is at today. And we have a other couple of items up here. Uh, if you have any interest in checking them out, please feel free to do so. Again, my, I am Chantel Swizer. I am the Practice Director of Strategic Data Services at Pivotry. Feel free to message me or anything like that. If you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, and I hope this uh, gave some additional knowledge of the importance of product data being clean, consistent, clear, and uh, complete. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chantal. Okay. And now we're going to move on to questions <clears throat> from our viewers. And just a reminder that if you do have some questions for any of our three presenters here, you can put that into the question box and click the submit button. Let's start with this one for John. <clears throat> so in all your descriptions of <clears throat> Uh, that you gave this this afternoon, whatever time it is. Uh, what are the core underpinnings required to deliver a great customer experience optimization approach? Thanks, Mary D. I I think in terms of un underpinnings, if you think about all the things I talked about, I talked mostly about the front facing aspects of it. And uh, the, real, the real meat of the matter is, is how you organize and structure your knowledge, as Chantal was just describing in a lot of detail. The thing that's overlooked from driving great customer experiences, uh, leveraging knowledge on all these channels, is the need to think carefully about uh, who your users are. Just what she showed on the last slide there. Who are you, who is using your information? How does it need to be organized? And what how do I vend it out to different channels? One of the most important things that is underappreciated is that knowledge has to live in many guises on all these tools. You wouldn't send a big 20 piece documentation set out on a chat. You wouldn't send even more than a couple of sentences out on social media. You wouldn't, and likewise, those couple of sentences would be somewhat disappointing to someone who is out searching a knowledge base. So you have to think carefully about how those things work. And then this thing about uh, schema taxonomy, uh, Chantel, is also interesting to me. It feels like it's become cool again. It used to be sort of this extra thing to do, but it's now, it's, it's now front and center and data modeling has is, is come back to being central to not only uh, vending to these channels, but also structuring information to be properly groveled by AI tools like large language models. So, so to me, it's, it's still all about content. All about content. Chantal, do you want to talk about what's cool now? 
Oh, well, I definitely have to agree that schema is very cool as a product data. So high five there. <laughs> Pat, any comments? Uh, not beyond what they have. I agree. Schema is uh, is one of the lost arts and, and missing keys to successful uh, execution in these environments. And Chant Chantel, you're exactly right. Without clean data, um, the rest of it is a whole lot harder. Yeah, <clears throat> so true. All right. Now that we know what's cool, let me move on to another question here. Um, uh, Pat, let me let me direct this one to you. Uh, <clears throat> information findability is critical to the success of our uh, our reps. Their search results have to be fast, comprehensive, and most of all, accurate. So, how is AI going to help with that? Well, uh, great question. And uh, first, it helps with understanding the user's intent. And I think all of us have talked about search and how important it is. Um, what AI gives us that's uh, almost magical is this sense of understanding what they intended in spite of what they actually said or asked or typed. So that's the, I think probably the biggest value. I've been involved in lots of different implementations where lots and lots of rules are written to decompose grammar and sentence structure and words and nouns and verbs and all the stuff to try and glean some sense of understanding. But um, AI, it's not free by any means, but it does help a lot to get at um, the, what the user was trying to say. Okay, then. Um... Got another question here, Chantal. What different kinds of merchandising relationships are there to build AOV? And perhaps when you answer that, you'd also say what AOV stands for. <laughs> That's uh, average order value. So um, if, I was going uh, to say that, and I was hoping I was correct. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You got it. You got it. Um, Yay. But really, it's like if you go to a product page, um, then usually you can see some additional product relationships and you'll say like, oh, I'm like, a, I mentioned like a, that cell phone, like, oh, I'm buying the cell phone. Ooh, I really like that top socket or I really could use this um, cell phone holder to put in my car. And uh, so you'll see these different items that can be used with your cell phone and say, yeah, I want to get that too. And you can throw that into your cart and order those as well. So that definitely helps uh, to drive that up. And um, another part of it is uh, I mentioned substitution. Um, if uh, I'm going to buy this, uh, I don't know, this curling iron and I desperately need it because I have to go to a wedding tomorrow, uh, but it's out of stock, what one can I get in place of it that is closest to what I want in stock and get it like today? Uh, so those types of things also help as well. And there's things like, um, let's see, um, if you have, let's say you're buying a printer or you have bought a printer, there's the consumable products that go with your printer, like the, uh, the paper and the ink. So getting notifications in a timely fashion saying, hey, you bought this printer, uh, you might need paper already again. Why don't you order some paper from our site? Kind of like also providing that personalized experience also uh, helps drive that customer experience and also drives that uh, average order value. <clears throat> Makes sense. With the substitution, one also hopes that if you've ordered the curling iron, they don't find as a substitution just an ordinary hairbrush. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, or something yes, that's yes, totally yes. unrelated to hair so, care. <laughs> you have to make sure the algorithm is working properly. For sure. Yeah, I've heard some really funny stories about grocery online grocery shopping where the substitutions have been not at all related to the original order item. It's oh god, you do sort of, I believe that. You do sort of wonder about the algorithms at times. Like, oh, yeah. no but, kidding. And with all the allergies and everything out there, that'd be a really risky place to be playing that game. You're right. It would be indeed. Or, you know, they, they order a tomato and, and get a can of beans. It's like, what? How, how did that happen? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, oh. Speaking of mistakes, John, <laughs> we do have an interesting question here. <laughs> what are some of the biggest Sorry. What are the what are some of the biggest mistakes that organizations make in developing new or improved 
uh, customer experience optimization capabilities. Yeah, that's a that's a broad topic if you start looking at all the different uh, channels, some of which I was talking about today. But right. in terms of uh, implementing these these channels, you know, it, it goes back a little bit to what I was trying to explain about content. Um, we've become really enamored of our tools and toys around AI and, and auto generated information. And rightly so. There's a lot of really exciting things going on. But the, the one of the biggest mistakes um, and, and uh, Pat alluded to it towards the end of his presentation about uh, trying to identify what's going to really drive success when you're searching is that we, we get too enamored of the structures of what these tools do and, and, and not, don't keep it simple sometimes on how we try to vend stuff out. Back, back to your example from the supermarket, right? Someone needs mm -hmm. to attend to what people really want and not just stand up the technology uh, in an excited way. So I'll give you one example of uh, ill-considered uh, uh, interactions. So we have a product that listens, like I said earlier, listens to speech interactions and can trigger suggestions automatically while someone's working. Well, if you don't attend to what types of questions you want the, the automated speech to, to listen for, and on the other side, that, that we had a particular customer that didn't really sort of hand-waved at that and picked really general topics for the, the speech to listen to. And then the other side, instead of vending out tailored information for that set of questions happen to be about complaints they just sent a bunch mm -hmm. of big documentation sets so now this poor agent is getting this thing triggered every other minute because it's got so much stuff it's listening for and then as a reward they're getting pushed all these documentation sets you know you can imagine how excited they were about that so um you've got to think through the marriage of automation and content in any of these tools including ai i mean i was joking before we got on the call with you guys about you know, how many customers are now asking AI to automatically generate my content so I don't have to do it anymore, right? That there's, there's a lazy man's approach to all this stuff where you don't slow down and think about exactly what kind of customer experience you want to bend up from each of these tools and take the 80-20 rule. 80% of your stuff can be managed with 20% of your information if you think carefully about what people mostly ask about. That doesn't mean you won't get through to the more sophisticated scenarios later, but please, let's mm -hmm. walk before we can run and not get too far ahead of ourselves. Uh, chat is a great example. Chat was gonna save the world about five years ago and 40% of all chat implementations failed because people did not think about how shallow those interactions could be if you set the wrong expectations with the customers about what they could do on chat. Another, another example. Yeah, expectations I would think would be pretty important. I don't know, Pat, did you wanna weigh in on any of that in terms of mistakes? Uh, <laughs> they are many and varied, um, but uh, John and Chantel really um, hit a number of them. Um, so I, I think, I think uh, no, I'll just, I'll let that go. Okay. All righty. Chantal, um, this, is a, this is a question, this is an interesting question about value. Uh, does the value of data affect both B2B and B2C in the same way? I say it, it affects them the same way, but they use it for different things. So like when I think of a B2B uh, company, like we're thinking about these manufacturers and they have to send a lot of data to downstream channels. Um, they may have mm -hmm. e-commerce site, they may, not, they might have, may be very dependent on like the, uh, the Amazons and the Grangers and the Ebays of the world to sell their products for them. And in those cases, the completeness of the data becomes a lot more like it's it's 10 times even more important than it was even for them because now they're competing against market share with the other suppliers mm. that are selling similar products. So if they're selling like a, like bearings on, um, on Amazon and they're missing a lot of data for like the different bearing sizes and bearing dimensions while, while their competitor is sending complete information, both in the, uh, the filters, the competitor is going to have the edge mm -hmm. and then like in those price comparison sheets the competitor is going to have the edge so that's really where that starts to affect them and making sure that data gets downstream effectively when it comes to b2c a lot of mm -hmm. these b2c sites are distributors trying to collect the data from all these suppliers and a lot of times their big lift is getting the data from the suppliers and getting it mm -hmm. in a way that they can clean and organize it at a scalable pace because if they have like uh, 3,000 suppliers and they're onboarding like a, a couple thousand products like a month uh, and they're getting it in all these different formats, the lift to normalize that data and try mm -hmm. to get it into your system in clean fashion is, 
is really big and that's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a tough job to try to make happen efficiently yeah i'm assuming chantal that that would also be an issue for the taxonomist because they may be describing things in different ways so so true yeah they can be describing like using different terms um and like regionality is like a big piece of this as, as well as industry standard terms like uh, i live in wisconsin mm. so we refer to water fountains as bubblers but if I put that on a, you know, a national site, there would be people like a bubbler. Is that like a, a fountain for my front yard? Is this a bubble machine that I give to my kids? You know, they wouldn't really know. So having that regional terminality and trying to, uh, to master that, uh, always a fun one. And like in the taxonomist, they'll also be getting terms in different, um, in different ways, different attributes to describe the products from all their different suppliers. And they're going to be in charge of governing all that data coming in. So not just the values, but yeah, like you said, that the different taxonomical terms, the different attribute terms, there's a, they have a lot to juggle with all of that data set. Well, Bubbler, I have now learned something about Wisconsin that I did not know. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Pat, here, here's a here's a question for you. Uh, sure. The human connection that our human customer service reps offer is really important for our brand. Are you saying that computers can replace that? I am not, and I hope it never happens. Although you know, the <laughs> world is suggesting that that might be a possibility that we all get replaced. But the truth okay. is. It's going to be a long, long time before that uh, the the liveness of a human connection is re um, indistinguishable from what a computer can do, um, and, and I hope it never happens, honestly, because um, I guess liveness is a is an important uh, way to describe what a what a human can bring and creativity as well to think gosh what's an outside the box solution to this problem that's not the same solution everybody gets who's in this sort of broad category of problem space being able to have that uh, empathetic interactive connected mm -hmm. relational experience between a person in a call in uh, who represents the brand and the the frustrated or challenged caller who's really struggling with whatever the product is, that connection is what really forms those relationships that create stickiness between the customer and the, and the product manufacturer, distributor, whatever, um, that makes that uh, relationship um, valuable over time. So, um, that's that's how I would answer that. I'd, I'd like to chime in on this one, Mary, Mary D. Just Go ahead, John. I, I think it's it's even it's critical to understand that when I was in a call center, we used to say a customer calls to express an opinion about their problem. <clears throat> they don't actually know what they they know what they want, but the customer service agents have to negotiate that with the language and the expectations the customer is using, mm -hmm. and then broker the right solution against a combination of resources, interactions, offerings. So. There's no way we're going to automate that, nor should we, as as, uh, as Pat was just saying. They 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 serve an invaluable role here, and I'll give you one one quick example about that. You know, we uh, we're building LLMs, and and you know, you find mm -hmm. that customers are still thinking keyword. So in a banking uh, LLM, mm -hmm. they'll type balance. So now, what's the LLM going to do with that, right? So so we we can't just assume that end users are along for the game of providing these rich uh, AI enabling experiences, and so. There's a, a fair amount of negotiation and decision making that that we're never going to replace with machines. That's my view. Chantal? Yeah. And the other thing is the the machine is going to struggle to ask a really good, insightful follow up question, or yes. a series of follow up questions to get exactly to the pain point before they so that they're solving the right thing. That's such a good point, John. Mm -hmm. That that people so rarely actually express what the real problem is. Most of the time, they don't even know. They yeah. don't know. And they sometimes will ask something because they think it's something that the rep can answer. So mm -hmm. they're trying to make life easy. And then other times right. they, they want to make sure that they get the answer they want, whether it's the correct answer or not. Mm -hmm. So dealing with people, what I'm hearing it's, you guys say is that dealing with people requires people. 
Well, people. and the tools yeah. I showed today are are semi assisted. Every tool I showed you today has like a, a buddy. It's, it's like something that appears while you're working to help you. It does not take the wheel and, and start driving. Right. Okay. Good way to phrase it. Excellent. Okay. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. And we apologize. We were unable to get to all your questions. But as I stated earlier, all questions will be answered via email. And I would like to thank our speakers today, John Schmay, Senior Director, KM Strategy, Varent, Pat Heffel, Head of Partner Success, LucidWorks, Chantal Schweitzer, Practice Director, Strategic Data Services, Pivotry. If you would like to review this event or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's event. It will be archived for 90 days. Plus, you will receive an email with the URL to view the webinar once the archive is posted. If you would like a PDF of the deck, go to the handout section once the archive is live. And just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon card. The winner will be announced on March 29th. We will reach out via email if you are selected as this month's winner. Thank you again for joining us.